Hello everybody and welcome back to Web Security. In this video, I'm going to be talking to you all about the same origin policy. So the same origin policy is the policy that your browser uses when it decides how to handle uh, requests and responses to different origins. So let's look at what that means. So we can imagine that we access some web server and we ask for the re root resource. We make this get slash HTTP 1.0 web request and we get a bunch of HTML back. Well, that HTML back based off of kind of the fundamental concept of the web is that all of these resources are like linked together, right? The web forms a web, right? It's a web of data and we might want to reference data on different websites, different web applications. We might say, okay, well, I've got my website and this other website has this really cool image and I want to show that really cool image on my website and I want users to be able to see that when they look at my website. So in this case, we, we go and fetch this root resource from this specific web application and it says, okay, well, I have two images. I've got some text and then I've got two images I want you to see. I want you to see this red image and this blue image from two different web servers. Okay, so these two different web servers, as it turns out, are gonna be cross origin. It's gonna be different origins. We're no longer going to the same origin. We're no longer accessing the same web server. So our browser doesn't care, it's fine. We're going to go ahead and access those resources, right? We, even though we, we only asked for uh, resources from one website, our browser on our behalf thinks, you know what, they wanna see this image. Let's go ahead and fetch that from those other web servers. So it goes and fetches the red image from the red server and it does a get slash uh, at the HTTP 1.0 web server and it returns back, you know, this, this red image we can imagine. And we might also do the same thing to blue, but maybe blue has an issue, right? We go and make this web request to blue and only people authenticated with the blue web server can see the blue image. So even though, you know, we've got this, this first web application and we want like our users to be able to see blue, well, it turns out they can only see blue if they've already kind of authenticated with the blue server, if they've already got session information with the blue server. Otherwise, the blue server is going to reject them and say, no, you can't see this blue image. So, you know, we can imagine, you know, this web application is, is cool for a lot of people, but it's extra cool if you've already got session information going on with the blue server. So we can, this, get, this gets denied because we just made a GET request and didn't include any session information. But maybe the user that accessed it was, in fact, authenticated with the blue server, did have session information. Well, maybe our browser has seen, right, it's, it, our browser is acting on our behalf for all these web requests. It knows we've already authenticated with the blue server. It's seen the cookies for the blue server. Why, why not just send those cookies along, right? This would uh, improve the user experience if we just pass these cookies along as well. If we just said, well, okay, I, I know that this user who's using my browser, right, this, we've got this browser program that's acting on the user's behalf. They've already authenticated with this blue server. They've already logged in. They've already gotten this session cookie. I'm going to pass those along with the request because that seems like a good idea to improve the user experience. Why not? Let's pass the session cookie along and perform this. And suddenly now the user gets to see this person's website that has this text and this red image and this blue image. Right? We've got all these cross-origin uh, requests being made. It turns out whether or not to include those cookies and whether or not to make these requests and whether or not to allow even seeing the response to those requests happen is all things that your browser must very carefully do um, in order to protect you and make sure that you know, you're not suddenly sending off session information, making a request uh, that Gray has tricked you into making, right? If Gray just tricked you into making this web request, that would be really sad. Uh, so we need to be very careful and consider the security of what's going on here. Okay, before we start looking at that and looking at what it means to be an origin, let's think back to an HTTP URL scheme. So we've got this concept of a scheme followed by a colon, slash, slash, and then we've got this host, colon, port, slash, path, question mark, query, pound, fragment, right? We've seen this, this URL structure in the past, in past lecture series. Uh, so we've got this URL scheme. So what does it mean for an origin exist? What do we mean when we say origin? Origin is very clearly defined. An origin is a tuple, a, a collection of data, where we are talking about the scheme, the host, and the port. So we kind of can ignore the path, query, and fragment portion of a URL. And we've just got to look at this scheme, host, and port. This is what we mean when we say an origin.
So for example, we have HTTP example.com. Well, it turns out that the origin is HTTP example.com 80, right? This is, this is the origin of this URL. Well, we might also have HTTP colon slash slash example.com slash cat.gif. And this has the exact same origin, right? Again, we're not looking at the path, the query, or the fragment. Fragment. We're just looking at the scheme host and port, and it matches, right? We're on HTTP, good. We're on example.com, good. And we're on port 80. So the browser recognizes these two URLs as having the same origin. On the other hand, if we go to HTTPS example.com, this no longer has the same origin. We've now got this issue where uh, we're using a different scheme. HTTP and HTTPS, very similar, but they're not the same scheme. And so they have different origins. Similarly, if we go to httpcats.example.com, even though it's like this subdomain thing, it's like a, a sub of example.com, is not the same origin. These are different origins. Uh, we've got HTTP, sure those match up, but example.com and cats.example.com are two different hosts, and so it is two different origins. And similarly, if we go to httpexample.com and we're looking at a web application not being served over the default port 80, instead we want to access this over port 8080, again, different origin. We're no longer the same as 80, 8080 does not equal 80, different origins. So this is the concept of a same origin versus a different origin. We're looking at the scheme, host, and port. Okay, so the same origin policy as it relates to whether or not we are even allowed to send an HTTP request. So whether if, if we're if we're sending to the same origin, basically anything goes. You're good to go. You can send the requests you want because you're, you know if we're on the same origin, then clearly if this web application is asking you now to make a request to uh, a different resource, but on the same origin, like it's slightly different URL, same origin. Clearly, you know, it intended for that, so it's all good to go, right? It's all same origin stuff, it's safe. Same origin policy really kicks into effect when we go to different origins. What do we do about different origins? And well, if we're going to send a cross-origin HTTP request, uh, not all of them are allowed. Fortunately, I mean, this is a very common, as we said, the World Wide Web, we've got this web of data. We want to be able to perform this a lot. Uh, it turns out that simple, what's called a simple request is allowed. What do we mean when we say simple? Well, we mean a request whose methods are get or head or post. So these three methods. And we are allowed to customize the following headers. We're allowed to change the accept header, the accept language header, the content language header, the content type header. Uh, to these specific values. You know, the content type is a little restricted. You can't uh, specify an arbitrary content type uh, when you're, so imagine you're posting data, right? You're posting data at some web application. You've got body, data in the body of that request. You can send form URL, www form URL encoded data. Uh, you can send multi-part form data. For example, if you're like uploading a file to a web application or something. Uh, and you can also send plain text. Uh, but what you can't send is like JSON, for example, a content type of JSON. You can't make a post request at a JSON API uh, cross origin. It's just same origin policy says, no, you cannot do this. Um, we can also specify a range header, customize that range header with some simple values because the range header allows a little bit of complex stuff. But this is all you can do. These are the simple requests you can make. Fortunately, this is good enough for like loading in an image. Uh, it's good enough for a lot of applications, a lot of simple stuff, but this is the restrictions, the dictations that uh, have been made uh, standardized that all browsers follow. Hey, simple requests can be made cross-origin. That That is it. Okay, now th that's one end, right? Sending the data. What about receiving the data? It turns out these are two different concepts. You can send a request, but are you allowed to re even read the response? So maybe you can send a request, but you can't read the response. It turns out that is exactly what happens with these cross-origin requests. You can send these requests, but you actually cannot read the response in a lot of cases. Now, where can you effectively read the response? Well, you can effectively read the response when your browser is taking care of parsing that data and embedding it into the site. So for image tags, video, audio tags, object embed tags, for example, like you know, we embed a YouTube video into some website, we can embed uh, 
inline frame so we can iframe, we can reference out to some web application and kind of that web application can be kind of embedded within our web application. We can reference uh, CSS, so styling of the page out to web app, other web applications, other websites, other origins. Uh, and we can pull JavaScript from other origins as well. So the reason in some sense that this is all allowed is the browser is taking care of this, right? It's the browser that's going to read the response. The browser is going to render this image and put it on the site. Uh, arbitrary ja JavaScript though, cannot, for example, read this data, right? You can't make a request and then say, hey, what are the raw bytes of the response? So the browser can take all of this data and these very specific HTML embedded elements and, and display that for the user to see. But if, for example, you're running some sort of JavaScript making these requests, JavaScript, you can make these requests, you just can't read the response. Uh, the requests you can make specifically, right? We can make those simple requests. Uh, you can't make more complicated requests, but you can make simple requests. So for example, you could post data at a web application using JavaScript, um, and that other web application is going to receive that data, and it's going to be able to do whatever it wishes to do with that data. But the JavaScript in making that request cannot then read the response. So this, this is useful. There's, there's applications for this where you might want to have your web application start sending data to a different web application, but you cannot receive results from that. You cannot read the response. So non-HTML embeds are disallowed by same origin policy. Again, this has to do with cross origins. If you have the same origin, you got your same origin, your, you want JavaScript to start talking to your web application on your same origin, it can start reading the responses, no issue, right? This is very commonly done. It's very important that this can be done. This has to do with cross-origin. Cross-origin reading of responses is heavily restricted. Okay, now, so that is the concept of the same origin policy and whether or not you can send a request and whether or not you can read the response. Now we need to kind of change gears here a little bit and talk about another concept. And before we do so, we need to kind of talk about some definitions of some concepts here. So, We've got this concept of a domain name. And what is a domain name? You've probably seen things like this before. Uh, a domain name is a bunch of labels, these like little text label things, delimited by dots, right? www.example.com, www.google.com, and so on, right? These are domain names. This entire string of data is the domain name that we're referencing. And often, right, you're gonna type this into your, your browser, the, you're gonna specify some domain name, and you're gonna go there and access resources at that domain name. Okay, so definitionally, we've also got a concept of a top-level domain, which is just the rightmost label of the domain. So, right, we've got the com top-level domain, we've got the UK top-level domain, we've got the college top-level do domain, we've got the IO top-level domain. There's all sorts of top-level domains, and that's just the rightmost label of the domain. Now, we've also got what's referred to as an effective top-level domain, and this one's a little more tricky because this is actually defined according to some Mozilla published list, right? So Mozilla publishes this list of what's called the public suffix list. And this public suffix list determines what it means to be an effective top level domain. So it's not a simple definition, it's not just the rightmost label, it's whatever this list says that the effective top level domains are are the effective top level domains. So again, we've got top level domains like com that is also an effective top level domain. But for example, when we want to visit like UK, United Kingdom specific websites, it's kind of cool that they have their own little domain system go going on over there, but we don't want to just say that UK is the only you know top level domain they get. That we want this concept of an effective top level domain using this public suffix list, right? Co.uk, probably isn't gonna be a very cool website. We want a bunch of people to live on top of co.uk. So co.uk is an effective top level domain. So it turns out, right, we've got www.google.com that has the com effective top level domain. Well, Google also wants kind of a UK specific version of the website and they host that on www.google.co.uk and that co.uk is the effective top level domain. Now, we've, again, college is an effective top-level domain. Uh, all top-level domains are also effective top-level domains. Uh, yes, is that true? I think that's true. We'll have to confirm, but I think that's true. Uh, 
dojo.pwn.college college is the effective top level domain. And then interestingly, maybe it makes sense that you know the United Kingdom gets their own like concept of this effective top level domains and other countries do as well, right? You might have like gov.uk and all that sort of stuff. Uh, GitHub.io is also an effective top level domain. So if you host a website through GitHub, um, and you want like kind of this custom domain on top of it, github.o is a public suffix. We, we can treat github.io as an effective top level domain in exactly the same way that co-uk is an effective top level domain. Why am I defining all of this? Well, the reason I'm defining all of this is we need to know what it means to be a site. A site is a very well-defined term, and a site is an effective top level domain plus one more label to the left. So if com is an, an effective top level domain, which it is, example.com is a site. Uh, Google.com is a site. Google.co.uk is a site. Notice that Google.com and Google.co.uk are two different sites. Now we also have pwn.college. And then you'll see, again, pwn.college, right? So it turns out that pwn.college and dojo.pwn.college where college is the effective top level domain are both the same site based off of this definition of what it means to be a site. So pwn.college and dojo.pwn.college are the same site. They're different origins. Again, if we think back to what it meant to be an origin, we're going off of that whole host name there. They're different origins, but they are considered the same site, right? The definition of a site is an effective top level domain plus one. So we can have a bunch of github.io, and this is the reason github.io is a public suffix. It's a very popularly used uh, effective top level domain that other people host their sites on top of, right? their domains on top of. So pwncollege.github.io is its own site. And then connornelson.github.io, for example, my name, my website, it would actually redirect to my website, is also a different site. Uh, and the reason, right, we need github.io to be a public suffix is that otherwise everything hosted on GitHub, GitHub pages, right, GitHub, uh, GitHub allows you to host websites on it, otherwise everything would just be the github.io site. We don't want this. That's why we have a public suffix. We got this list and everything effective top level domain plus one is a different site, just plus one. Everything else, you know, it, it mashes into the same site. Again, Pwn College, College. Different origins, same site. Okay, so this is why we've defined this whole site business. On cookies, we have an attribute called the same site attribute. And it takes a number of different values. And this attribute dictates whether or not cross site, again, different than cross origin, cross site requests can be made. So again, a site is kind of a more relaxed version of an origin. A bunch of different origins can be the same site, right? Right, dojo.pwn.college and pwn.college, different origins, same site. So that kind of allows them to all follow under the same umbrella of what it means to be a site. So the same site attribute, and if same site is none, Cookie is the cookie, that particular cookie, which this attribute is assigned to, is sent in cross-site requests. So we kind of like just throwing, not necessarily throwing security out the window because there's legitimate reasons you would do this, but no matter what, we're just going to send this cookie in cross-site requests. If, uh, if site A wants you to make a request to site B and it's able to do so under the same origin policy, right? The same origin policy is still in effect here. This just has to do with cookies. This says that if B's cookie was the same site equals none cookie, well, now when A asks your browser to make a request to B, uh, that cookie will be sent to B because B di dictated that the same site is none. You're able to just make send these cookies along with me. I want to know, right? Because you might just have like little preferences, right? Maybe Maybe you're on your, you have some image hosting website and I have a, a user preference that I want all images I see to be in black and white. And I get this web application to assign me this black and white cookie with same site equals none. Now when all of these other websites say, hey, access this image on this image host, your browser is going to send that black and white cookie along with it, and now you're going to get black and white images in return. So it's kind of cool, right? This is the same site attribute. If, if it's equal to none, cookies are just sent. Again, request is only made if it is a uh, same origin policy accepted request.
This just has to do with cookies. Okay, so then we also have the same site equals lax value, which is the default as of very recently, as of, I believe, 2020. Uh, it used to be the case that the default was same site equals none. So by default, all these cookies would be sent in cross-site requests, which is it's a little scary. Uh, but now the default has become same site equals lax, which is the new default as of like 2020-ish. Um, in, in fact, it turns out as of the recording of this video anyways, here in 2022, near the end of 2022, same site equals none is still the default in Firefox. So this is, this is a very new change. Uh, Chrome, same site equals lax is the default. The web standards say that same site equals lax should be the default, but it turns out Firefox is still working through some things. The default is actually none in Firefox. They're not following the standard yet. Uh, as of the end of 2022 anyways, the recording of this video. Um, anyways, so same site equals lax means that the cookie is only sent in cross-site top-level navigation get requests. Really, it's safe requests, but we can just consider that to be get requests for now. Uh, safe also includes like head requests and stuff. Um, but this cookie is sent in cross-site top-level navigation get requests. What does that mean? Basically, what that means is when you click on a link, for example, right? Your browser, the, the URL in the browser bar is actually going to change. This is a navigational event. You're no longer, you're not just fetching an image, right? You could fetch an image and you would fetch an image with a get request. That is not a navigation, a top-level navigation get request. Again, so a top-level navigation request has to do with the browser. It's a browser-specific concept. There aren't like headers in the get requests that say, hey, this is a navigation get request. This is a browser concept, not an HTTP concept. But with same site equals lax, the cookie is sent in cross-site top-level navigation get requests. So for example, if you click on my link, my website might say, hey, come check out uh, this other web application. I think they're cool. If same site equals lax, which is the default, your cookies will be sent in that request uh, as you navigate to that other website, which is is pretty cool so for example and we'll see i guess with same site equals strict you can imagine why that's the default but same site equals strict the cookie is actually not sent in cross-site requests so the reason that might be the case is you can imagine hey check out this cool website and that cool website is the exact resource that would transfer money from my bank account to someone else's bank account, right? We don't want to just instantly send the cookies. This is this is terrifying, right? I mean, realistically, there should be authentication going on there before you perform any very sensitive operation. But there's pages where you know we don't want you to be authenticated immediately. We we want you to re-authenticate, and that's where same site equals strict comes into play. If uh, if I dictate that this cookie is same site equals strict, the cookie is not sent in cross-site requests. It just won't be. You're gonna have to re-authenticate. Or when the page loads and then starts loading other resources, now we'll be back into the same site, same origin, all of that, right? After the page loads, then we can start loading those resources. Uh, but at least in that initial get request, that initial navigation get request, the cookie won't be sent. I mean, it'll never be sent, but it also won't be sent as it is with the lax request in a top level navigation request. It's just not going to be sent. So this is why, you know, maybe you've access to your bank, uh, done some some quick online banking and then you close the tab and you open a new tab and you go back and you type in you know go to mybank.com again and suddenly you're just like logged out like what is that it turns out the same site equals strict you just made another top level navigation get request by reaccessing your bank website and suddenly you're like logged out but it's like I just closed the tab I was already logged in why did that happen same site was strict you have to reauthenticate this is how this is performed Okay, now we also have a few other attributes on the cookie. We have the domain cookie attribute, and this basically says, okay, the cookie is sent in request to the specified domain and any subdomains. So this, uh, by default, is just going to be, if unspecified, the cookie is only sent in requests to the setting host, excluding subdomains. So basically the person who set the cookie. Someone said uh, HTTP response saying set cookie. Uh, it's only gonna be sent to that origin or to that host that said that. Um, this actually, if you use this attribute to specify a domain, is actually just going to be laxing up the cookie. So for example, if I am on, let's say, um, Pwn College, right, that website, Pwn.College, and I send a cookie, I send a response cookie saying, hey, set this cookie. If I want that cookie also to be sent to, let's say, dojo.pwn.college and Pwn.College, 
right? I would say that the domain is Pwn.college. College. I would specify that attribute. And now the cookie is actually going to be sent to Pwn College and dojo.pwn.college. College. It's going to be sent to any subdomain. So this is why you might use that. It's actually to laxen up the the restrictions. This doesn't actually restrict things. It laxens up the cookie to be able to be sent to other domains as well. And finally, we also have this path cookie attribute. So the path cookie attribute is cookie. The cookie is sent in request to that particular path and any other subpath. So I might, for example, um, set a cookie to only work on the slash docs, the slash documents uh, path. Well, now this cookie is only going to be sent when accessing um, slash documents and like slash documents slash a dot PDF, you know, and b dot PDF, etc. Right? All those sub paths of the initial path. So this this kind of constrains us a little bit more to hey, we only want this cookie to go on sub paths. This isn't necessarily. I'm not familiar with the real world use cases of this necessarily, but it is an option that the browser supports and will handle appropriately. Okay, so we've talked about the restrictions of, for example, with the same origin policy, um, how you're not able to read responses and how you're only able to make these simple requests. Well, it turns out, right, as all things do, I want more power, right? I might want to allow people to start reading the responses of my cross-origin resources. I want, like, I want to host a bunch of data and I know that all these other people are going to be running these JavaScript applications on their web applications, and I want them to be able to access the data and pull it in, read the response, and do all this cool data interoperability stuff. Okay, so the default is you can't do that, but if we want to laxen this up, the browser does allow this to be laxened up. We can kind of ignore the same origin policy, kind of explicitly say, yeah, the same origin policy is cool, but you know sharing is also cool. And I want to explicitly say that sharing is cool. So that is where cross-origin resource sharing, commonly referred to as uh, CORS, C-O-R-S, uh, comes into play. So the way that that works is that we have this concept of a pre-flight request. So if I want to make an arbitrary request at some web server, so a non-simple request, obviously in the case of simple requests, we can just make those requests. But if I want to make a non-simple request, I have to basically ask for permission from the web server on whether or not I'm allowed to make this request. And you can kind of think of this as, what, what do you mean ask for permission? Like, if I was just sitting in Python, or sitting on my shell using curl, I could just make the request. What do you mean you have to ask for permission for it? I can just make the request. You have to think about this in terms of the browser security model. The browser doesn't know whether or not it's safe to make a request. It's really the browser that's asking if it's allowed to make the request. So the browser is doing this pre-flight request. Of course, if you wanted to just make the request outside of a browser, you could make the request. Uh, but within the browser, the browser doesn't know whether it's safe to make the request or not. It only knows that these uh, simple requests are safe to ma be made based off of the standard of web security. This is the model everyone follows. Everyone knows they have to consider the model of web security from browsers. So the browser wants to ask, hey, can I please make this request? So like, I've got this JavaScript running on my page and it says it really wants to make this request. I'm going to ask you, am I allowed to make this request? And what it's going to do is a pre-flight request, a core's pre-flight request. And it's going to use the options method. It's going to do options on whatever that resource is. So maybe the root resource or maybe um, a specific resource that we're trying to get ready to make a request at if, if allowed. And we're going to specify these headers. We're going to specify my origin. And again, it's the browser that's making this request. So it's going to make sure that all of this is correct. And if you didn't want to do it through your browser, you could have made it anyways. Uh, so the browser is saying, okay, well, I've got... Uh, a.com, a, a.localhost, or whoever, you know, whatever origin. I've got origin A. Asking origin B, I want to make a non-simple request. And so I'm going to say my origin is A. The browser is going to say, hey, the origin's A. Um, and then it's going to say, I want to do this um, non-simple, this unsimple 
uh, request with this method, this access control request method. You have to think, right? We're doing an options method in the actual in this uh, pre-flight request. We want to say what kind of uh, method we would normally do. Are we going to be getting ready to do a get request? Are we getting ready to do a post request? Are we getting ready to do some put request or some other weird fetch request? We can do any sort of uh, request we want. Uh, we have to ask for permission first, right? This is what the browser is getting ready to do. We're asking for permission. What method are we about to do with this request? What custom headers am I doing? Remember, a simple request could only have uh, a set number of customized headers. Maybe we need to get ready to do custom headers, right? I want to very specifically make this request with a non-simple header. So my, my request I'm about to make, if you give me permission, is going to have these headers, right? We set this all up, and the browser asks, is it going to be safe for me to make this request? Now, the server, if it's configured to use cores, is going to make a response to this cores request, this pre-flight request. It's going to do a pre-flight response. And it's going to say, uh, in this case, we're just returning an HTTP 1.1, 204, no content. You could imagine returning like a 200 or something. But we're just saying, hey, there's no, no content. We're just about to return a bunch of headers, really, to answer that question, right? We're just, we've got like this query mechanism just occurring over headers. The body of these requests and responses don't mean anything. So we're just returning no content. Um, and we say, in response, the server gets to dictate whether or not it's safe for the browser to make this request. So it says, access control allow origin. So this is going to specify what origins are allowed to make requests. So this could say um, A. It might say, hey, A, A is good to go. A can make requests to me. It's safe. Browser, you are safe to have A make requests to me. I trust A. A is good to go. A can make requests to me. I trust them. They, I'm going to share resources with A. I've already vetted A. A is safe. Okay, so that can be an allowed origin. Or we could specify star. Star is just kind of a uh, symbol that means, okay, I trust everyone. You know what? None of this, none of those requests you're going to make are going to be dangerous to me. There's no dangerous, unsafe requests that can be made. Maybe I'm just hosting a bunch of publicly accessible data, and I want JavaScript to be able to read in that data. You know what? Go ahead. Allow everyone. Okay. And if you wanted a bunch of origins, well, you know the origin that's making the request, so you specify that singular origin that is allowed to do it. And you can, you know, your server can respond accordingly depending on the origin asking. Okay, now we're also going to say what methods are allowed. Uh, is get allowed, is post allowed, is put allowed, is fetch allowed? You know, what, what methods are allowed? What headers are allowed? What headers can you include in this request? Or is this request that you're about to make that has these custom headers, you want custom headers in this request that this JavaScript is begging to make, are we going to allow those headers? Are those headers allowed to be included, or am I dictating that unsafe? I don't trust A to include those headers in a request to me. We can also say, hey, are you allowing credentials? So what does this mean? Uh, more specifically, this means, at least in most applications, this means are we allowed to pass along our cookies? So maybe I can say, hey, not only can you make this request, but you can make this request with cookies. And this is awesome because, hey, now we can start doing stateful and authenticated operations across different origins, right? We can, for example, have some authenticated user say, hey, what are all of, how much money do I have in my bank account, right? I can make that request and actually read the response and I can successfully make that request because I'm using my cookies. So now uh, origin A can kind of show to you how much money you have in your bank account by accessing this API with uh, origin B and the browser is actually gonna send the credentials along because we've allowed credentials in this, uh, this request. And then we also have this concept of access control expose headers. So these are actually, you're going to be able to not just read the response body, but actually re uh, read the headers that are exposed. So I might have useful data that this JavaScript needs to access that's going to come through those headers instead of just through the body of the HTTP response. And we can expose headers to being readable as well. Now, We've got also, right, so this is kind of the pre-flight request, pre-flight response. If we think back to um, those simple requests within the same origin policy, right, if, we, if we're making a get request, uh, this is considered a 
get requests with only those specific headers being used. This is considered a simple request. Um, and we're allowed to make this. We don't actually have to make a pre-flight request. The browser has already said, you know what, this is a simple request, it's safe to do, go ahead and make the request. Um, but we, we thought about, right, remember we weren't able to read the response by default. So in this case where we're making a simple request, if we also want to be able to read the response, we don't need to do this pre-flight because we're already allowed to make the request under the same origin policy. But this gets to determine whether or not we are allowed to read the response. So we didn't pre-flight. We can just immediately answer the question without that whole pre-flight business because the request is already allowed. We can determine, okay, are we allowed to read the response? So we can just also, in these non-pre-flight like pre -flight, uh, request response stuff, also in just a standard response, include these access control headers for cores. We can say access control allow origin. Uh, a, so hey, A is in fact allowed. A is allowed to read the response from my B origin and read the results of that. It made a simple request and not only did it make a simple request, but it made a simple request that I trust them to read the response. Now, this next one is access control allow credentials. Um, this has to do with uh, if cookies were sent, are you still allowed to read the response? So this is you can kind of think of this as, right, we're using the same site attribute. Think back to the same site attribute. That decides whether or not cookies are going to be sent in a cross-site um, context, right, in a cross-site. Again, this is, gets a little tricky because we have a concept of an origin and a site, but the same site deals with whether or not cross-site cookies will be sent or not. If we say same site equals none on our cookie, uh, that determines, hey, this cookie is going to be sent everywhere, uh, no matter what site, what cross site you're going to. If that cookie was included automatically because the same site attribute was determining whether or not cookies are being sent, uh, this is going to say, okay, well, am I allowed to read the response still even though a, a credentialed request was made, even though a cookie was included? So this determines that. And then we have access control expose headers again. This allows us to determine whether or not we are able to read header responses. So some of this is a little bit tricky, right? We've got a concept of an origin and a concept of a site. A site is kind of an umbrella. There's under one site, we can have a bunch of origins, right? Dojo.pwn.college and pwn.college are all of the same site, but different origins. And we have these different mechanisms along the way, kind of you can imagine a flow chart of determining, hey, can the request be made? Can the response be read? That is same origin policy. Is the cookie going to be sent or not be sent? That has to deal with same site attribute on cookies. And then we also have this laxening of the same origin policy with cores in determining whether or not extra requests, non-simple requests can be made and whether or not the response can be read or not. It's a little bit tricky, a little bit of, uh, of work to wrap your head around, but this is all of the fundamental uh, mechanisms that your browser is using to safeguard itself uh, when dealing with multiple origins and multiple sites and all of these things interacting with each other by way of your browser.